Hi, so I'm very into two things right now. The Tollywood movie RRR, which is three hours, and R.F. Kuang's book Babel, which is 500, over 500 pages long. And I actually have been longing to make a video essay about why these are actually essentially the same stories with the same goals and themes, but they just go about it in completely opposite ways. And uh, each time that I tried to do this, I got bogged down in a section where I wanted to defend that the protagonists of Babel, Ratmi and Robin, are a romance, not a friendship, a romance. I decided to make it its own video because I don't actually know to what extent this is actually being debated. When I first read this book back in September and then I looked around at the reviews, there did seem to be a lot of people debating whether or not it was a romance where some people would say, oh, well, the main character clearly had feelings for his best friend. And other people would say, no, he didn't. I didn't read. I didn't see that at all. So I do feel like I want to make it clear why I definitely 100% read this as a romance, because I'm used to sort of being in fandom culture where often we look at a property that is not intended as a romance. We see subtext there and we choose a romantic reading. And I just don't feel that that's what's going on here. I do think that the text very much supports a romantic reading and you have to stretch a little bit to read it as friendship because then some of the interactions, I would argue, don't really make a lot of sense. Um, now, the thing is, if you disagree with me, I'm not here to argue with you. I'm not trying to say that my interpretation is the only correct one. Obviously, with works of art, everybody can have their own interpretation. That's the way things work. The author's intent only goes so far. If you have a reading, if you read the text and you take away something different from what the author intended, I think that that is 100% your prerogative. And adding to that, I do think that when we're talking about what is a friendship versus what is a romance, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm arrow ace and I have spent a lot of time in my real life trying to figure out where is that line for me and ultimately had to conclude it's, it really isn't a solid thing. It's very arbitrary. It lies wherever I say it is. So I do think it would be disingenuous to say that this is, there is a clear way to read this. But the difference between real life and, say, a book is that if something is in the book, it's there because the author put it there. And if you start having to ignore sections to make sense of, uh, to make your reading work, I do think that uh, it's maybe not actually supported by the text. So um, this, all, this is all just to say, uh, when I first went into this, because there was so much debate around it, I thought that I was maybe reading into the text more than was there. But the more that I have gone back and reread and uh, written, worked on the script, the more I've been like, no, this is t very textual to me. Um, it's obvious in the text. So I wanted to talk about this. Now, obviously, there are going to be huge spoilers for Babel. Please go read Babel first and then come back and watch this. And um, there are going to be minor spoilers for the Moribito series by Urahashi Nahoko, as well as The Countess Below Stairs by Eva Ibbotson. Now, one of my favorite things in books is when I see romances that are written without necessarily laying things out plainly in text, and it's often done through subtext. Now, my top two examples in some of my favorite books ever, the romance between Balsa and Tanda in Uehashi Nahoko's Moribito series, and the romance between Anna and Rupert in Eva Ibbotson's A Countess Below Stairs, which has later been republished as A Secret Countess. In the first volume of the Moribito series, it's clearly stated that Tanda is in love with Balsa and has been since they were children, but Balsa cannot settle down. She always needs to be on the move, and for this reason, it's unrequited. She's never going to settle down. Now, the, there's a subtle shift in their relationship between volumes three and five of the series. They're not in volume four. Uh, volume four focuses on a different character, but they go through, their relationship goes through heavy strain in volume three. And then at the beginning of volume five, we see that Balsa has not left Tanda's house in the time that has elapsed since the end of book three. And there are subtle, subtle details, such as how 
previously, when Balsa would show any physical affection to Tanda, he would blush and stammer. And now in book five, when she reaches out and touches his face in reassurance, he just, he's very calm about it. And um, the author actually is on record saying that this is, this was a deliberate choice that she intended for particularly keen-eyed viewers to notice that their relationship is not what it was defined as in book one anymore. But in the text, it's not actually clarified that they are now very much together and very much committed to each other until book 10, which takes place several years after books three and five. It's not confirmed until uh, Balsa is looking for Tanda and she finds him wounded and the person who is looking after him asks her, well, who are you? And she introduces herself as his spouse. And this is the first time that the text clarifies what their relationship has actually become. But in fact, it's been that way for several years in the books. And if you were paying attention, you could see that. Now, it, this kind of works in the Morivito series because the relationship between Balsa and Tanda is not really central to the plot. Arguably the same as Rami and Robin. Whether or not they are dating is interesting to us, who are the readers who are invested in their personal lives and relationships, but it's not really part of the story. The story is about some is about other things, about the politics and the magic and the oppression that people are suffering. Whether or not Balsa and Tanda are dating is not the plot. So the author gives us tidbits about about these things, but she does not lay it out in text. And even though I was very much invested in their relationship, I liked that about that book. Didn't beat you over the head with the romance and sort of just left clues for you to pick up on if you were paying close attention. Or in my case, if you were just scouring the internet for what has the author said about this. It's a little different with A Countess Below Stairs by Eva Ibbotson because this is a romance novel. This is this one. The plot is very much about Anna and Rupert getting together. That is the central story. And this is one of my favorite things about Eva Ibbotson's romances, that she does not necessarily have scenes of the characters kissing or declaring their loves for each other. This is not how she writes romance. She writes romance in a much more subtle way. The Countess Below Stairs contains one particularly powerful scene where Anna, who at this point works as a housemaid in Rupert's household, she has this very, very long, beautiful black hair. And she's decided that it's fashionable to get it cut into a bob. So she goes to a barber shop intending to get it cut. Rupert sees her from the street going into the barber shop. He knows that she's been talking about getting her hair cut. He comes storming into the barber shop and tells her, you can't cut your hair. And she says, why not? And he says, it's against the rules. And she says, what rules? He says, the rules that I'm going to make right when I get home. And she says, well, then I quit. <laughs> I get this is my this is my week's notice. The energy goes out of him. And he says, oh, but I have, must have something. And he finally calms down and looks around and realizes what he's doing. Uh, he touches Anna's hair, says, OK, that's my ration for all eternity. Gives the, apologizes to the barber, gives him some money and says, just cut her hair however she wants and leaves. That's the entirety of the scene. There's not one word of love being spoken here, but this is the moment where we, the reader, are being informed that these two are very much in love and they are aware of it, but they're also aware that it is not correct. Anna is Rupert's employee as well as he has a fiance <laughs> and they're both not going to act on it or talk about it but they are very much in love. And in fact, we don't find out what Anna did after that. For several pages afterwards, the story just keeps going and we're not informed whether or not she went through and cut her hair. She actually didn't. She actually, after that, she left the barber shop immediately without getting her hair cut for Rupert. And again, that's another thing that is not laid out in the text that she did this for Rupert. It's just so, at some point it's revealed to us that her hair is not cut. And that is... The revelation that they this is mutual. <laughs> so what I'm trying to point out is that the text did not explicitly state it was a romantic relationship. It's not the same thing as the text does not support a romantic reading. These two are very very different things and um, 
what I'm trying to say is that, well, in Babel, it is not explicitly laid out in the text that Rami and Robin are in love with each other. The text very much supports a romantic reading. The only thing that Uehashi Nahoko and Eva Ibbotson did that R.F. Kuang did not was include some clear confirmation about what their relationship was. So what I actually want to do is I want to read you five excerpts from this book. Uh, now, I did not actually reread the whole book to find excerpts that support this reading. But these are just five scenes that I either remembered off the top of my head or that I was just skimming through the book and went, oh yeah, this happened. Now, there are other scenes as well. These are not the only five scenes. I just think that these five alone fully support that <laughs> this is a romantic relationship. So I'm going to read them to you. Um, so the first one is the scene where Robin and uh, Rami meet for the very first time. And um, Robin enters the alleyway, sees someone else was already standing at the door, fiddling with the lock. He had to be a new student. Satchels and trunks were scattered on the cobblestones around him. He was, Robin saw as he drew closer, very clearly not native to England. South Asia was more likely. Robin had seen sailors with the same colouring in Canton, all from ships arriving from India. The stranger had smooth, dusky skin, a tall and graceful build, and the longest, darkest eyelashes that Robin had ever seen. His eyes flickered up and down Robin's frame before settling on his face, questioning, and determining, Robin suspected, just how foreign Robin was in return. And then they introduced the, themselves, and just to explain where they're from, and then they have this exchange. What do you think? Awful weather. One side of Rami's mouth quirked up. And the only thing I can eat here is fish. They beamed at each other. Robin felt a strange bursting feeling in his chest then. He'd never met someone else in his situation, or anything like it. And he strongly suspected that should he keep probing, he would uncover a dozen more similarities. He had a thousand questions, and he didn't know where to start. Was Rami also orphaned? Who was his sponsor? What was Calcutta like? Had he been back since? What brought him to Oxford? He was suddenly anxious. He felt his tongue stiffen, unable to choose a word. And there was also the matter of the keys and their scattered trunks, which made the alley look as if a hurricane had emptied a ship's hold onto the street. Should we, Robin managed, just as Rami asked, shall we open the door? They both laughed. Rami smiled. Let's drag these inside. He nudged the trunk with his toe. Then I've got a box of very nice sweets, which I think we should open, yes? And that's, that's just the scene of them first meeting. That's only about a page. And uh, the next scene is very, very shortly after this. I believe this is still their first day. It's, uh, it's in their first few days of knowing each other. From their vantage point at South Park, they could look over the whole of the university, draped in a golden blanket at sunset. The light made Rami's eyes glow, made his skin shine like burnished bronze. Robin had the absurd impulse to place his hand against Rami's cheek. Indeed, he'd half lifted up his arm before his mind caught up with his body. Rami glanced down at him. A curl of black hair fell in his eyes. Robin found it absurdly charming. You all right? Robin leaned back on his elbows, turning his gaze to the city. Professor Lavelle was right, he thought. This was the loveliest place on earth. I'm all right, he said. I'm just perfect. This is something Eva Ibbotson does as well. Particularly, I'm thinking of a scene in The Morning Gift where a character looks out of the windows as he's realizing how in love with he is. He looks out the window and he thinks how the garden has never looked quite that lovely. <laughs> this very much reads the same way to me. Now I'm going to skip ahead about halfway through the book and uh, it's in their third year at Oxford and they are at a party. And this is the scene where Robin realizes that their friend Letty is in love with Rami. Why won't you dance with Letty? I'm not looking to start a row. No, really. Please, Bertie, Rami sighed. You know how it is. She wants you, Robin said. He'd only just realized this, and now that he said it out loud, it seemed so obvious that he felt stupid for not seeing it earlier. Very badly. So why... Don't you know why? Their eyes met. Robin felt a prickle at the back of his neck. The space between them felt very charged, like the moment between lightning and thunder, and Robin had no idea what was going on or what would happen next, only that it all felt very strange and terrifying, like teetering on the edge of a windy, roaring cliff. Abruptly, Rami stood. There's trouble over there. And the scene, the moment ends. Now, uh, shortly after this, there's another scene where Letty, this aforementioned friend who's in love with Rami, is talking to Robin. Uh, and for a moment, 
Robin thinks she's talking about something other than what she means. It can't be easy, she said to Robin one day, you and him. Robin, who thought at first she was talking about Rami, stiffened. I don't... How do you mean? It's just so obvious, she said. I mean, you look so much like him. Everyone can see it. It's not like anyone suspects otherwise. She meant Professor Lavelle, Robin realized. Not Rami. He was so relieved that he found himself engaging in the conversation. It's a strange arrangement, he admitted. Only I've grown so used to it that I've stopped wondering why it isn't otherwise. I'm not going to read that far, but at the end of this scene, uh, Letty actually calls Robin Birdie, which is what Rami calls him, and Bur and Robin has to stop himself from telling her, no, that's Rami's word. You can't, you can't call me that. Now we get into fully spoiler territory. Uh, the very, very end of the book, after Rami has died, is actually, this whole section is where I, reading it for the first time, started realizing that this the way that I was reading it was as intended, not just something that I was concocting in my mind because of the way that Robin reacts to Rami's death and the way that Rami is repeatedly referred to as Robin's world. But the excerpt that I'm going to read is at the very, very end, right before Robin is about to die, when he thinks back to the first morning he spent with Rami. He went back to his first morning in Oxford, climbing a sunny hill with Rami, picnic basket in hand, elderflower cordial, warm brioche, sharp cheese, a chocolate tart for dessert. The air that day smelled like a promise, all of Oxford shone like an illumination, and he was falling in love. It's so odd, Robin said. Back then they'd already passed the point of honesty. They spoke to one another unfiltered, unafraid of the consequences. It's like I've known you forever. Me too, Rami said. And that makes no sense, said Robin, drunk already, though there was no alcohol in the cordial. Because I've known you for less than a day, and yet... I think, said Rami, it's because when I speak, you listen. Because you're fascinating. Because you're a good translator. Rami leaned back on his elbows. That's just what translation is, I think. That's all speaking is. Listening to the other and trying to see past your own biases to glimpse what you're trying to say showing yourself to the world and hoping someone else understands. So what I actually do end up fluctuating on is whether or not this is intended to be a situation where they are in love but have not acted on it because they are so, or Robin in particular, is so afraid of what society would say if it found out, or if this is a Balsa and Tanda situation where they are together in the background and we just are not privy to this as the reader. And I tend to go back and forth. If you have any thoughts, I would love to hear about them in the comments. Uh, if you are here but have not read the book, I'm sorry for the spoilers, but please read it anyway. It's a wonderful book. It I've been referring to it unironically as the book love of my life. and. I read it five months ago and I am still burning for it. it. It still burns in me. It's an amazing book. As I said, this is kind of just an offshoot of a video essay I wanted to make about RRR and Babel. So if you're interested in that, that should be probably being uploaded soon, hopefully. Thanks. Bye.